so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, equivariance and naturality. So the word naturality here refers to natural transformations. And if you Google that word, uh, you'll get uh, a lot of hits about how to become really muscu muscular without uh, anabolic steroids. But this talk is not about that. This is about uh, the category theoretic notion, uh, which as I'll explain today, is a uh, generalization of the concept of equivariance, which of course, as I'm sure uh, you, you all know, is uh, a very uh, central concept in uh, geometric deep learning. So, uh, the way to think about this talk today uh, is uh, uh, that I'm essentially functioning somewhat like a recommender system. Uh, so I, I know that, uh, uh, you know, based on your uh, your presence in this, this workshop, you're probably interested in groups and equivariance. And uh, so I'm just guessing that you might also be interested in this uh, uh, more general concept of categories and naturality. And now I can throw even more buzzwords at you. Uh, and uh, who knows, maybe some point in the next hundred years, people will start to apply this. Uh, but um, uh, for now, we'll just, uh, you know, we, we, we won't go too far. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about categories and naturality. Um, and uh, this will be somewhat of a theoretical talk. At least the, the first section will be uh, completely uh, theoretical, uh, just to explain these, these mathematical ideas and, and, and how uh, this notion of naturality can preserve some of the important ideas of, of uh, uh, or uh, equivariance, the, the reasons why we are interested in equivariance for applications, while broadening uh, the concept and uh, apply, being able to apply to more situations and also potentially being able to loosen some of the constraints that we put on the network layers that we build uh, in order to make them natural, but not necessarily equivariant. Um, then I'll cover two examples of how this can be used. It will still be quite theoretical and I won't go into empirical results or anything, but you can you can check out the, the papers. Um, the first is uh, natural graph networks, uh, which uh, is a, an application of these ideas to, to uh, well, graph networks, graph convolutions and so on. Uh, and then I'll uh, talk briefly about a recent work where I try to uh, understand the notion of a causal model, which I think will be quite an important thing for uh, in, in AI, uh, try to understand that from this, uh, this mathematical perspective and show how also there this concept of a natural transformation plays an important role. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. And let's start actually by, uh, you know, reminding ourselves why uh, we are, uh, we care about equivariance. So Symmetry transformations relate uh, different but equivalent descriptions of an object. So some cases in which that uh, uh, that that comes comes up in applications is if you have an image, for example, uh, then a translated or rotated version of that image captures essentially the same information. Uh, but it's somehow represented in a different way. The numbers that are actually stored in your computer are different. And similarly, if you're trying to uh, apply machine learning to a mo molecule, for example, you're going to have to represent that molecule probably by writing down lists of coordinates, X, Y, Z for each atom, uh, and then store them at those points in a certain order. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and both the coordinates and the ordering of the points is arbitrary. We don't think of that as meaningful. So the upshot is you have many equivalent uh, ways to describe the same uh, object. And when we apply machine learning to such inputs, of course, we, we want the network to, uh, to respect that, uh, those symmetries, to, to respect those equivalences essentially. Uh, and that's the fundamental idea of geometric deep learning. That's at least the viewpoint we take in our the book that we've been writing, for which there's a uh, an early draft from last year is, is available in the archive, where we try to understand many uh, geometric deep learning uh, methods from this perspective of, of symmetries. So it's a very important idea. Uh, but symmetry groups uh, have some very particular properties. So first of all, uh, one always assumes in the definition of a group that uh, group transformations are invertible. So no information is lost. 
And the second thing you assume uh, is uh, composability, uh, you could call it. So the idea that any two symmetry transformations, uh, we can compose them and we'll get another symmetry transformation. And of course, if you consider the general concept of a function, then uh, it need neither be invertible uh, nor uh, composable. The composability depends on whether the domain and codomain of the two functions uh, agree. So there are many reasons why you might want to loosen these assumptions. And uh, this leads us to the general mathematical framework of category theory, where you have the main concepts that we'll look at today of category, functor, and natural transformation. And we'll see how these are a direct generalization of the concept of a group, a group representation, and an equivariant map that uh, are so central in uh, geometric deep learning. And as I mentioned, this, uh, you know, looking at this more general framework has the potential for less restrictive network architectures uh, and potentially new application areas. Now, this is by no means a new idea or insight. Uh, indeed, the very first paper on category theory called a uh, general theory of natural equivalences from 1945 uh, had this uh, uh, quote here. Uh, they say this may be regarded as a continuation of the Klein Erlanger program in the sense that a geometrical space with its group of transformations is generalized to a category with its algebra of mappings. And uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not sure uh, if everyone is familiar with the history here, but the the Klein's uh, Erlanger program, uh, which is also the inspiration for for our book, the idea what there was that we can understand uh, in a systematic way all the different geometries that are out there by uh, 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 looking at the the, the uh, each geometry as the study of those. Uh, concepts that are invariant under a certain group of symmetries. So Euclidean geometry uh, studies lengths and angles and so on, because those concepts are uh, invariant under Euclidean transformations. In uh, in school, you probably learned about congruent figures. Well, that's that's basically the idea here. Uh, and other symmetry, uh, sorry, other other geometries can be understood. Uh, and their relation, uh, relationships can be understood by, by looking at these uh, groups. And now uh, what they're saying here is uh, this is a, a generalization of that philosophy. Okay, so what uh, what is a category? And we'll first look at an example that uh, you're probably all familiar with, which is, uh, uh, well, maybe you're not familiar with the category concept, but with the idea of a set uh, and a mapping between sets. So in general, a category consists of objects and arrows. Arrows are also called maps or morphisms, depending on the context, but that it all means the same thing. Uh, and so arrows are denoted like this, just like a function, uh, although it need not be a function. In general, it's uh, indicated as F with a domain A and a codomain B. Uh, and uh, the category uh, uh, says that, uh, well, if you have two of these with the appropriate domain and codomain, if you have a function G that has domain B, uh, then uh, we can compose it with F uh, and we get another arrow. So in the category of sets, this composition operation is given just by the ordinary composition of, of uh, functions. Uh, I think you, you all know what that means, applying one function to the output of the other function. But um, in general, in a category, you kind of forget how this composition operation is implemented. You just have an arrow, and you have another arrow, and the composition operation, which is part of the definition of your particular category, that tells you which other arrow you get. And you could define it in terms of function composition, uh, but you can, as we'll see later, also uh, uh, just define it uh, synthetically or in some other way. Uh, yeah, so the key, key thing to mention is that category hides all the details. So we have our set X, set Y, and this arrow indicates a function from X to Y, which could be implemented like this. Maybe it's a three element set here and a two element set, and there's a particular mapping that takes this element here and so on. Uh, but in the category, you just see this, and you also see how it composes, but not anything else. And it turns out that that is usually enough to study uh, whatever it is you're interested in. So here's the general definition. 
Uh, so category consists of objects and arrows such that for every object, there's an identity map in your category from A to A. Um, and for any two arrows with appropriate domain and codomain, F and G, uh, there's a composite arrow as indicated by this figure. You have an arrow a F from A to B and G from B to C. And then G after F is an arrow from A to C. Um, and it has to satisfy only two simple properties. The uh, identity function should uh, act as a unit. So if you compose it with any F on either the right or the left, that should not change the, 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 the arrow F. And the composition should be associative as all function composition, for example, uh, is clearly uh, associative. And that's it. So it's a very, very minimal amount of structure. Uh, but it turns out already with this, you can do a lot of interesting things. And of, of course, because it's so uh, general, uh, well, it applies to a lot of situations that uh, you might want to study. So here's some examples of categories. So there's the example of category of sets sets and functions, vector spaces and linear maps, uh, topological spaces and continuous maps, groups and group homomorphisms, all of those form uh, categories. Um, th those you could think of as categories of mathematical gadget sets, vector spaces, topological spaces, groups. But you can also very often look at the mathematical gadget itself as a category. So as we'll see, this will be key to this talk. A group is a particular kind of category with certain properties. A groupoid is a generalization of that. A pre-order, something totally different, a certain kind of mathematical structure is also a certain kind of category. And then there's an emergent field, uh, emerging field of uh, applied category theory where people use categories to model uh, different kinds of phenomena. So you can model resource theories, that is a theory about uh, uh, amounts of stuff of various kinds and processes that turn certain stuff into other stuff, whether that's chemical reactions, turning certain amount of, of, of one uh, molecule to, 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 to another, or uh, you know, uh, baking a, a, a pie uh, where you need a certain amount of eggs and flour and so on. Uh, you, can, you can apply it to many things. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, am of the belief that this may uh, turn out to be useful in, uh, in AI uh, in order to model various kinds of uh, phenomena. There are other examples like Markov categories from probabilistic models, Bayes nets, causal theory, monoidal categories where you can model processes happening sequentially or in parallel. And so this is a very, very rich uh, field of uh, modeling languages, essentially. All right. So um here's one example a pre-order uh is a, as a category just to 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 give you a little bit of an example before you turn to groups and equivariance and so on um so the classical definition of a, of a pre-order is that it's a relation uh, uh on elements of a set a and b that you can in usually interpret as somehow being less than or equal uh, and it should be reflexive. So A is less than or equal to A. Transitive, if you have A less than or equal B and B less than or equal C, then also A is less than or equal C. Uh, and sometimes you have additional axioms, but in a pre-order, you don't need them for necessarily. Um, so there are different kinds of orderings, of course. You reachability in graphs, ordering of numbers, ordering of subsets by inclusion, and so forth. Um, now, the categorical definition says that a pre-order is a very special kind of category. It's namely a category with any number of objects, but for any two objects, there is either zero or one arrow uh, from A to B. May also be another one from B to A, but ne never two arrows uh, from A to B. Whereas if A and B were functions, like in the category of sets, Sorry, if, if, if A and B were sets, as in the category of sets, and you had the arrows were functions, then you could have many functions from A to B. In the pre-order, only, or at most, one. Um, and the way we interpret the arrows, we say, if there's an arrow from A to B, uh, we'll say that A is less than equal to B. Uh, and you can verify that uh, already then by the definition of the, 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 the category, the identities, uh, axiom, and the the... the uh, associativity uh, and the composition rule, you get the two axioms that you classically have. So because you have an identity arrow from A to A, 
therefore a is less than or equal to a. So the reflexive axiom holds and the transitive axiom also hold because you can compose arrows. All right, so that was one extreme. You have any number of objects, uh, but at most one arrow between them. Now a group is another uh, extreme uh, where you have only one object in your category. And uh, uh, so to define this, we first need to define the concept of an isomorphism in a category. Sorry. So an isomorphism in, in any kind of category is a mapping at, or an arrow f from a to b such that there is a arrow g in the opposite direction, which if you compose it on either direction, uh, you get the respective identity operation, uh, identity arrow. And so, you know, in the usual case where these f and g are functions that corresponds to an invertible function, uh, but here you define it without saying what the arrows are, right? It's just a categorical definition. It just says, if you compose these things, it's equal to an identity. Um, now we have a classical definition of a group. Uh, I'm sure many of you know it, a set with associative binary operation, not relation, identity maps, inverses, etc. cetera. Um, and there's the categorical definition. So, so a group is a category with one object where each morphism G is an isomorphism. Now, uh, these morphisms G, these arrows are going to be the, what are usually called the elements of your symmetry group. So, um, and here's where we get this composition, uh, this, this uh, composability thing that I mentioned before. Because every group element is modeled here as, a, as an arrow from G to G, uh, you can also compose them. That's part of the assumption of a, of a category. Uh, and that's also part of the assumption of a, of a group. Um, uh, whereas in a general category, if the domain and codomain don't match, uh, you can't compose them. Here, we can always do that. And by assumption, uh, in any category, uh, composition is associative, just like in a group. Uh, we have identity, also need that for a definition of a group. And all the arrows are isomorphisms, so you have inverses. So pictorially, you can think of it like this. You have your category, has one object, which you could also call G, and it has a bunch of arrows that can be composed. And uh, there's one special arrow, the identity. OK, interesting. So we have the fundamental concept in the study of symmetry groups. And it is a special case of a category, or at least you can encode it as such. Uh, you can generalize this notion to something called a groupoid, uh, where which is a category where you might have more than one object in a category, but still, just like in a group, every morphism is an isomorphism. So you can think of it as an invertible uh, mapping. So the example that we'll look at uh, it, when we look at natural graph networks uh, is the category of graphs where the objects are graphs or particular encodings of a graph, like a, as in a, a particular adjacency matrix. And the morphisms in the general category are graph morphisms, graph homomorphisms, uh, but you can restrict it to, to only consider the isomorphisms. Uh, and uh, that gives you a groupoid. Um, we'll look at it in a bit more detail later. Um, now, one interesting thing is that a, a groupoid has two kinds of maps. So you have isomorphisms from one object to another, and you have isomorphisms from one object to itself. And those are called automorphisms, which is just another word for symmetry. So if you have a graph, then and an isomorphism from the graph to itself would be a symmetry of the graph. And again, we'll look at more examples uh, uh, soon. OK, now. Um, it, again, in geometric deep learning, uh, this, this sort of the second uh, concept that, that you consider is this idea of a group action or group representation. So um, uh, let's say you have, a, a, I don't know, a convolutional network. Uh, you have your input space. Uh, it's a space of uh, signals on a, on a plane, maybe. Uh, and uh, you have a group of symmetries, let's say translations and rotations, and it acts on these signals. Um, the same group can also act on different spaces, right? If your output is uh, a class, 
uh, like let's say a, a binary value, uh, that's a scalar that should be invariant to uh, transformations. So that's a trivial group action. Uh, or if your output is a vector, uh, a two-dimensional vector, then maybe if you rotate the image, you want the vector to also rotate. That's again, a different example of a group action. Or if you are doing semantic segmentation, then you want the output to transform in the same way as the input. And so the general uh, uh, recipe or the general geometric deep learning blueprint that we describe in our book is that with every feature space, including the input space and the output space and all the intermediate feature spaces of your neural network, you associate a, an action uh, of your group, or usually it's a linear group action, which is also known as a group representation. So what is that? So the definition, so a group action or representation is essentially a, a mapping row that assigns to each abstract group element uh, a linear or nonlinear function such that the compositional structure of the group is preserved. Um, so uh, let's see, do I have an equation? I'll have an equation later. Um, but I think many of you will, will know this uh, definition. Um, now, then that's the concept that applies to groups. We saw a group is a special kind of category. And as it turns out, there's an analogous notion that applies to any kind of category. So if I have two categories, one C uh, and one called D, then a functor from C to D is uh, two things. It, it consists of a mapping on objects and a mapping on arrows or morphisms. So it takes objects uh, from the category C to objects in the category D, and it tames, takes arrows in the category C to arrows in the category D. And if my arrow in C goes from A to B, A and B being objects of C, then um, the corresponding arrow in D goes from the, you know, from F of A to F of B. That is wherever A and B are mapped to by uh, uh, the, the map on object. And for it to be a functor, it has to satisfy this constraint, which is what I meant here by preserving the compositional structure. So if I have two arrows, they can be composed. I can apply the functor to the composed arrow, or I can compose in D the uh, arrows that they are mapped to. So a couple examples of this very general uh, idea. So a functor between groups, when you encode them as uh, I, as categories, uh, a functor between two of them is a group homomorphism. A functor between pre-orders is a monotone map, or a, a, you know, a non, uh, or how do you say this, a non-increasing or de decreasing map, or something like that. Uh, a group action is a functor from the group G, viewed as a one-object category, to the category of sets. So let's unpack that. G. Uh, be, uh, uh, the categorical encoding of our group has one object. So the functor maps this one object to a set. That's the set on which the group acts. And then it also maps all the morphisms, all the group elements to functions. And so for every group element, you get a function such that the compositional structure of your group is preserved. And you can do the same thing for a, um, a, a, a group representation or linear group action by saying that's a functor from our group to the category of vector spaces. So now it picks a vector space on which to act and a matrix or linear mapping uh, for each group element. Okay, so we've seen group, uh, group action or representation, and now uh, uh, you would define equivariant maps if you're studying geometric deep learning. Um, so an uh, equivariant map is defi defined, as I mentioned, with respect to uh, two group representations of the same group, the one acting on the input space and one acting on the output space. Uh, so uh, we have a group, a group G, group element little g, rho is the representation in the input space, and then we say f and rho prime is the representation in the output space, and we say f is equivariant if it satisfies this equation. Transforming an input and then applying our function is the same as applying our function and then transforming it with the output representation uh, uh, afterwards. 
uh, and uh, you know we all know familiar examples uh, convolutions in the are equivariant to translations group convolutions are equivariant to whatever group uh, you choose like rotations and translations or continuous rotations of a uh, of, uh, of a uh, data on a sphere or graph neural networks uh, which are equivariant to permutations so they all fit into this framework um, then we again have a more general notion natural transformation so this is probably where if you've never seen this your head will really start to spin uh, so a natural transformation between functors, rho and rho prime, uh, functors from with the same domain and codomain category. Uh, that's the only way you can find natural transformation. That is a, uh, a, a mapping, one for each object of C uh, that maps from uh, wherever the first functor sends that object to wherever the second functor sends that object in your category D. Um, so it's a bunch of mappings, one for each object, and it has to satisfy a certain uh, property that looks suspiciously like the uh, equivariance constraint that we have here. Uh, so for every arrow in C from A to B, we should have that this component of the natural transformation A to A followed by uh, the functor applied to our arrow should equal the, the first functor applied to our arrow fo followed by the uh, component eta B. So again, it's it, 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 this takes really quite a lot of uh, playing around with before it starts to feel intuitive. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the definition and at least in terms of pattern matching, you can see the similarity to the, to the equivariance equation. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see that indeed an equivariant map is a, is literally a natural transformation between two functors. If we take as our category uh, uh, the uh, the group G, the one object category, and um, then we have two functors. That is our two representations that uh, allow our group to act on a vector space. Uh, then a natural transformation between those functors, between those group representations, is just an equivariant map. For each object A of C, while there's only one, that's capital G, you get a mapping in the codomain category D, so that's a linear map, uh, such that this equation holds, and that's exactly the equivariance condition. Okay, so um, I hope you got some of that, or that at least I was able to convince you that uh, this is an interesting thing to look at because that again, this is a, I'm acting here as a recommender system. I'm just saying, if you like equivariance, uh, you might find this this stuff interesting. It's totally normal to not be able to immediately find all these uh, definitions intuitive because it, it just takes a bit of practice if you've never seen it before. But the key message is natural transformation is a generalization of equivariance. Um, so let's see how we can actually use this. Uh, and we'll start with uh, an example of graph neural networks. So this is a paper that we published uh, a while back. Um, uh, it's a project led by uh, Pim de Haan, a PhD student uh, working with uh, Qualcomm and uh, at the University of Amsterdam uh, and uh, Max Welling. Um, and PIM is really the uh, uh, the, the driving force uh, behind this uh, this project. So, uh, as I already alluded to, you can you can you can define a category of graphs, uh, and uh, so the motivation for that is well, again, the thing I mentioned on the first slide. There's many ways to encode the same object. So we have in our our head a sort of a platonic idea of a graph, um, but we can write a graph on a piece of paper, and then the nodes have some extraneous characteristics such as their position on the paper. You can slide them around, or we can encode a graph in computer memory, and then we'll have to choose some ordering, uh, linear ordering on the, on the nodes. And that's also not really part of what we think of as the graph, but there's no way to get around it. You have to encode it somehow. 
So let's choose one scheme of encoding graphs. And let's say we settle on encoding a graph as adjacency matrices. So you have a matrix n by n, and there's one in position ij if there's an arrow from i to j. And uh, if the uh, graph is uh, undirected or you know doesn't have uh, directed arrows, then uh, these matrices will be symmetric, let's say. Um, and uh, yeah, as I mentioned in the first slide uh, uh, or early on in the talk, uh, equivalent graphs or equivalent encodings of the same graph should be uh, treated equivalently. So that can be encoded in a category. So our objects of our category are going to be adjacency matrices. And we'll define a, an arrow between two adjacency matrices if they are related by a permutation, simultaneous permutation of the rows and columns. So here we see a graph with some labels for the nodes, one, two, three, four. And here's uh, another one, one, two, three, four, different ordering. So the nodes are permuted. Uh, the corresponding um, adjacency matrices are shown here. But clearly you can see these graphs are isomorphic. They're, they're essentially the same, they have the same structure. Uh, but two objects in the graph and because they're isomorphic we'll have an arrow uh, there. Um, and uh, yeah, you can clearly see how you can start to compose these, uh, these isomorphisms and how it really defines a certain uh, yeah, a category. And uh, we're going to only look at graph isomorphisms. There are also other graph uh, or mappings between graphs that you can define uh, where you can map multiple nodes to the same one. But here we're just interested in the isomorphism. We, we only want to achieve this, uh, you know, this idea that equivalent graphs should be processed equivalently by the neural network. Um, now, what you see here on the bottom is that there's also certain relabelings of the nodes, certain uh, isomorphisms, which don't change the uh, adjacency matrix. So in this original graph, uh, the node two and four, they clearly play the same role in the graph. Uh, and so if we swap them, uh, you can all even see it geometrically in this figure. That's a symmetry of this, this graph. And what that corresponds to is that it doesn't change the adjacency matrix. So now you have an arrow in your category from this object to itself. That's an, called an automorphism, if that map is indeed an isomorphism. Um, so it's important to keep those different uh, uh, kinds of uh, maps straight. We tend to refer in, in, in the geometric deep learning literature to all of them as symmetries, but really one, are, uh, one, one kind of map is isomorphisms, then there are automorphisms. And we want to respect the isomorphisms and the automorphisms are just the, well, the symmetries of, the, of the, this particular graph. Okay, so that's our category. And we talked about uh, uh, feature spaces or representations of groups. Uh, here you have uh, representations of the symmetric group, uh, or in the more general case, you can define uh, 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 representations of your groupoid, both of them being functors. Uh, I guess you're all familiar with with uh, some some of these examples. So you could have a uh, trivial kind of uh, representation, a scalar output. If you're trying to say classify a whole graph, then you want if you permute the inputs, the nodes, then the output, the classification of the graph doesn't change. So that would be a trivial representation where every permutation, say p12, that swaps the first and second node. Um, uh, as any other permutation is mapped to the number one. Uh, it is a valid representation. It preserves the compositional structure, but it's very trivial. Uh, you can have a vector feature where, with one feature value per node. And then the way the group acts on this is to uh, permute the, uh, the values, as you see here, one and two are permuted. Or you could have a tensor feature, uh, let's so say one uh, feature per pair of nodes. And the way the group acts here is uh, via uh, simultaneous permutation of the rows and columns. All of those are different uh, representations or, or functors. And then what is typically, uh, or well, one way to build graph neural nets 
uh, so-called equivariant graph networks. I think uh, they were pioneered by Hagai Maron, but uh, uh, also others have uh, worked on this. Uh, so there the idea is, we're just gonna interpret this adjacency matrix as a second order graph feature. Uh, and we're gonna stack it along the channel dimension with the node features. And then we apply a neural network to it. And we're just gonna constrain this to be equivariant. And now if you apply sort of the geometric deep learning blueprint, uh, you, you're gonna have linear maps, uh, uh, non-linear maps. The linear maps are have learnable parameters and you require everything to be equivariant, which puts a constraint on the parameter space. And these folks figured out what those constraints are. And the sort of the key result is that depending on exactly which kind of mapping you have from second order features to second order or first to zero order, it doesn't matter so much. The different kinds of uh, uh, graph features on the, that we saw on the last slide, uh, you get a different number of parameters, but the number of parameters is independent of the size of the graph and it is remarkably low. Um, and uh, that's a little bit uh, annoying, right? That's uh, uh, we want to build these big, over-parameterized, uh, powerful neural networks. But at least the most naive way to do this, you end up with very small number of parameters. So there's the symmetry group here is very big. It's a permutation group and factorial elements. Uh, so it kind of makes sense, but it's also uh, a little bit disappointing. So we can ask the question: Do we really need this very strong constraint? Uh, or rather, what is the what is the least uh, constraint that we can put to still respect these equivalences between different ways of encoding the same thing? Uh, and that we argue is given by this concept of a natural transformation. Uh, so one way to look at it is you can ask, could we use a different weight matrix for each graph, uh, i.e. adjacency matrix? And the answer is no, this would not be isomorphism invariant. Uh, but uh, you, you, if, you, if you impose the constraint that this, uh, that this should define a natural transformation, then uh, things make sense. So each isomorphism is in your category gives a constraint, uh, meaning if you have two um, adjacency matrices corresponding to an isomorphic graph, they're going to ha have to be processed by the same weight matrix. Uh, and if you have a, a graph symmetry, then you also have an isomorphism in your category, an automorphism, and that puts a weight sharing constraint on your weight matrix. Um, and so that is actually, that's all you need for your layer to respect isomorphisms to respect these equivalent ways of encoding the same thing. It's, and it's a looser constraint than equivariance because now you can have in principle for each uh, isomorphism class of graphs, you can have a different uh, uh, linear layer. Now, of course, uh, uh, computing graph isomorphisms is very hard. So um, uh, uh, that's not uh, something you can implement in practice, but we show in the paper a, a practical way of, uh, uh, of still making use of this. Um, so here's a, here's a, a summary of the analogy that we have, equivariant networks, natural graph networks. In one case, you have a symmetry group. In the other case, you have a symmetry groupoid. Uh, the feature space in both cases is a functor from the group to vector spaces or from your groupoid to vector spaces. And in both cases, a natural layer is a natural transformation. It's just in one case, that just means equivariant map. In another case, it means a more general kind of thing. Uh, now, there are some challenges with this approach. Uh, so these global methods are not scalable to very large graphs. Uh, and uh, uh, vanilla natural graph networks where you would literally use a different weight matrix for non every isomorphism class of graphs uh, would not automatically generalize to, to uh, new isomorphism classes that you haven't seen. Plus, of course, there's the computational uh, uh, issue of graph isomorphism. Um, and so PIM came up with a very nice uh, way to turn this into a message passing algorithm. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, explain this. Uh, I would instead point you to the, to the paper. It's, uh, it's a very nice uh, read.
Um, all right, so summary. So graph networks must respect graph symmetries and treat isomorphic graphs equivalently. The symmetries are automorphisms. They're not permutations of nodes, as is sometimes uh, uh, said. Uh, in all cases, a network layer is a natural transformation between functors or feature representations. And uh, uh, in this local version, you can exploit local symmetries uh, to uh, yield more uh, powerful uh, and still efficient graph networks that can es essentially uh, exploit local uh, subgraphs, uh, different motifs, and recognize them. All right, so uh, that uh, is the first application. Uh, then um, recently, I've gotten interested in causality, and it's kind of a, uh, uh, to at least to many people and also to me, it was a bit of a mysterious topic, but at the same time, there's a lot of suggestive evidence that this is quite important in, uh, in human cognition. Uh, humans and uh, even uh, you know, young children uh, 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 think in causal terms, and it kind of makes sense because our interest as, uh, as autonomous agents is in figuring out uh, what will happen if we do something. So if I uh, do something and that causes another thing to happen, causes another thing to happen, et cetera, I want to I wanna be aware of those uh, relationships. Um, but uh, yeah, as I said, the concept is, uh, is not always uh, very easy to understand. So uh, I, uh, I recently put out a paper uh, called Towards a Grounded Theory of Causation for Embodied AI, where I try to uh, yeah, uh, take this existing theories of uh, causation, namely structural causal models, uh, and uh, uh, to, to ground them and make them useful for embodied AI. Uh, you know, uh, th things like uh, 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 having a robot reason about if I press the light switch, then the light will turn on. Or if I press this domino, it will cause the next domino to fall and cause the next domino to fall. And that's that sort of thing. Um, so what this paper is about, it's a new way to look at causal models. It's not really a completely new paradigm or anything, it's, but it's a new way to look at it based on a different way of doing mathematics that emphasizes mappings. Uh, that's the category theoretic approach that I've been talking about. And emphasizing mappings, of course, is also very good from a deep learning perspective because whereas the, you know, the, the, cl the classical theories of causality are all about directed acyclic graphs, these discrete uh, structures, uh, in deep learning, we like to learn mappings and compose mappings into deep networks. And so this way of do, describing things uh, uh, is at least aimed at uh, facilitating uh, applications in deep learning, uh, even though the, I should say this paper is still purely uh, theoretical and just uh, aimed at trying to understand <laughs> what uh, causality is all about. Uh, so it's a new way to look at causal models based on a different way of doing mathematics that grounds the notion of intervention in actual behaviors or physically possible transformations of a state space. So in the theory of causality, uh, there's this sort of atomic notion of intervention. Uh, let's say you're a doctor, you study patients, and um, then uh, you measure their LDL cholesterol and, their, uh, uh, and whether they get heart disease and their diet and so on. And then you say, I'm going to intervene on the cholesterol variable to set it to five. And then you're interested or, or whatever, I'm just naming a number here, uh, but set it to some value. Um, and um, then you're interested in what, what, what would happen. Uh, but as you can see already from this example, that's quite an abstraction, right? What does it mean to set a patient's uh, cholesterol level to a certain value? And what I'm trying to do here is to connect it to actual behaviors that an agent can take. So you can change your diet, you can you can take a certain pill, or you can you can do things as a robot. You can press the light switch. That's an actual behavior. Uh, but the question is, uh, what makes a behavior uh, behave as an intervention as they are modeled in this framework? Uh, so this approach comes without metaphysical baggage. So uh, whereas sometimes if you're reading the causality literature, you know, they're not very explicit about it, but sometimes you get the idea that they're, that they're saying, you know, the world consists of causal mechanisms and so on, that there's, there, that it's asking you to believe in a new ingredient that may, is never mentioned in, in physics or, or anything, uh, doesn't talk about causality uh, uh, at all. 
uh, pretty much. Uh, and this uh, sort of um, uh, grounds it in very simple uh, concepts like a, 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 a time evolution uh, and stuff. And uh, this should be suitable for applications in AI. Now, there's also a lot of that this paper is not about. Uh, this is very early work. It's a six page uh, uh, workshop paper. Uh, so it doesn't cover uncertainty, learning of these models, confounding very important causal concepts, algorithms, etc. So it's just it's early stage, but it's trying to make sense uh, of this and uh, uh, get to a theory that uh, is useful in um, uh, AI, AI applications. So the existing frameworks have been developed for use by scientists uh, to understand uh, specific domains. So you have a scientist and they have understanding of some domain, which allows them to choose the variables that they want to work with. So the medical example, you have variables like cholesterol, you can apply it to economics and study interest rates and whatnot. Um, and that, so you choose these, the scientist chooses the variables. The scientists maybe also encode some prior knowledge about what causes what. Um, and the scientist is also the one performing actual interventions in the world. So if the causal model says, if you do this intervention, uh, then such and such will happen. Uh, then the scientist wants to verify this or falsify it. And for that, it, 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 they must actually perform certain behaviors and then make certain measurements. Uh, and then the causal model, you know, takes that the results of that uh, 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 or the causal algorithms, they take the, the, this data and they make some causal inferences. But the point here is the scientist plays a very crucial role. And so if you want to apply this to AI, where you just have an autonomous agent and, and hopefully as little prior knowledge as possible, uh, then you're, you have a bit of a problem with the, with the existing uh, paradigm. So that's what we want to get to. You have a, your autonomous agent, a robot. It can take actions and observations, just like in the mark of decision process uh, paradigm. Uh, and maybe it would be useful for this agent to have a causal graph or many causal graphs for different situations uh, in its head. Or maybe it's not even a graph, but some kind of way of encoding causal knowledge so that it can reason about the effect of, of interventions. That's the hypothesis that we are exploring. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you can see, there are some new problems there that uh, one didn't encounter in the case of uh, causality for science, and because now this agent must uh, uh, independently uh, choose variables, i.e. learn representations, causal representations, and also perform interventions. So the way we're going to model this is by turning everything into mappings. That's the categorical uh, philosophy. So we take the standard agent environment model that you find in uh, Markov decision processes. Uh, you have an environment, has some environment state and an action, and it produces a new state and an observation and the agent policy takes the observation and maybe agent memory produces new memory state and an, and an action. Uh, if we compose all of that in, uh, according to this diagram here, we see we get a mapping from the full state agent action uh, uh, sorry agent state action environment state to agent state action environment state that's called the one time step mapping um, and uh, you can repeat this many times then you get a many time step mapping that says if i start in this state and i run this policy for a while where what state do i end up in uh, you can also say, I run this policy until some termination condition is met. So now for every policy, we get such a mapping and we call that mapping do of A. And it's a mapping from the state space X, the product of these uh, three sets to itself. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that tells you what, what would happen if you took this action. Uh, one example that uh, we use to illustrate this is a robot playing around with dominoes. So it's looking at the, the dominoes via camera. It, you want it to be able to construct a causal model on the fly, such that if you perform an intervention in this model, it predicts what would happen to the system if you performed an intervention. For example, I can take away a certain domino and then I can reason, okay, if I press the first one, uh, which one are going to fall, which one are not going to fall. 
Uh, and that requires, uh, well, inferring the, the causal variables, one for each domino, inferring the causal relations between the dominoes that are adjacent, uh, and connecting that to your, you know, your motor skills of actually picking up and pushing dominoes. So we can then define something called an effect. Uh, so for that, we first introduce a mapping called a, uh, that we call the process that takes the state of the system X and produces an outcome in a set Y. Uh, for example, the process could consist of whatever happens if I press the first domino. Um, <clears throat> the effect of an action is just first doing applying the mapping corresponding to that action and then applying the process. So it's a mapping from X to uh, outcomes Y, from states to outcomes. Um, and now you can actually, here's where the category theory, uh, at least um, you know, I'm not describing it in much detail, but where, where it starts to come in. So you have two objects here, X and Y, states and outcomes, two objects in your, in your category. And you have your actions, which are arrows from the uh, state space to itself kind of like in a group, except they need not be uh, invertible. So this is technically uh, called a monoid, not a group. And then you have some other arrows going to Y and you can compose the, them. You can say, do this action and then this action and then follow the process that gives me a particular arrow from X to Y. So there's a particular compositional structure uh, that gives you essentially a symbolic theory of actions. Uh, then a representation of this is an actual assignment of sets a state space uh, and uh, functions uh, to these arrows. Uh, and uh, that is analogous to a group representation in the uh, in the case of equivariant networks. Uh, right, so then when can you say that such an action model is, is accurate or veridical? Well, let's say we have a system with states X bar and y bar and let's think of these as sort of the micro state of the system so you know include you could include all the air molecules and their positions and whatever you like and you have your robot who can execute a certain policy which will uh, induce a certain transformation of the state space right so for your action for every action that uh, it can take every policy it has uh, it uh, induces a certain transformation and we run the process we get a certain set of outcomes uh, but of course, we don't want to reason about the microstates. So we want to reason about some abstract high-level variables learned by maybe a neural network that we call, uh, uh, you know, feature space X and outcome space Y. And we'll have model a model of our actions and a model of the process uh, by learned mappings. And we say that this model is accurate when th uh, there is a natural transformation indicated by the vertical arrows between the microstates of the system and the macrostates. Um, so now this natural transformation, again, it's just, it's, you see it already from the diagram. It's completely analogous to the idea of an equivariant map uh, uh, that we're probably all familiar with. Uh, right. So one cool thing is this is for the, this is, you know, in, in the classical causal model literature, people say, well, uh, this intervention should predict correctly the effect of doing an intervention in the real world. But of course, you can't describe that as a mathematical relation. And here, uh, for the first time, you can actually define this. Um, we haven't, however, talked about causal variables or causal relations at all yet. So uh, for that, we have to first introduce variables. So we say our sp space of uh, outcomes is now a product of a bunch of variables, let's say one for each uh, domino, indicating its state. Um, and then you can consider uh, the, uh, uh, the the concept of possible and impossible outcomes. So basically, you have this process, and certain outcomes are possible, certain are impossible. For example, if I have two uh, if I have two dominoes, they can be in any position. Uh, either one can be in any position, but no two of them can be in the same position at once. Uh, and so, th so that that is never going to happen as an outcome of your your process. Uh, in other words, the image of your mappings is not the full joint space of uh, the causal variables. Um, and that uh, implies that you can learn something about the outcome of one variable from another. And this is actually where the, where the, where the, 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 the idea of causality comes from. Um, so 
I'm see I see I'm running out of time, uh, but uh, let me just say that there is a way to define a certain concept of determination, where you say uh, the outcome of one variable is determined by the outcome of another variable via a certain mapping, and then uh, we can def define a mechanism, which is a key concept in causality, as a uh, determination relation that's invariant uh, to uh, to interventions on other variables. Uh, this is the, uh, this is going way too fast for you to be able to understand it, but uh, maybe I uh, can manage to convince you that there's interesting connections here to well, first of all, the whole equivariance literature and to this notion of of invariance that plays a very key role. And uh, this is not at all apparent in the classical uh causality frameworks that uh, that have been developed but you can bring it out uh, in this way uh, you can also encode all structural causal models in this new framework so it's really um it really captures uh, this notion of uh, causality that the existing frameworks capture um, but it has certain nice properties that uh, they don't so to conclude this part of the talk uh, we give a new perspective on causal models. Everything is based uh, on maps and composition. We use very little mathematical structure. We just talk about sets and functions. So in that sense, it's very elementary. Uh, other uh, uh, works uh, maybe use um, differential equations or whatnot. No, it's very simple. Uh, the discrete graphs are not part of the definition, but they can emerge implicitly under certain conditions. Uh, we give a very concrete definition of an intervention, which didn't, uh, which we hadn't didn't have before, uh, and thereby it grounds the theory of structural causal model and actual behaviors, and it gives a definition of a mechanism as an invariant uh, predictor. Uh, right, and with this categorical treatment, even though it's very implicit in the in the paper that I put online, uh, it opens many possibilities for the mathematical study of causal models and model abstraction via the notion of natural transformation between models. If you are interested in this stuff, uh, here's some recommended reading. So, so category theory has really a reputation of being very abstract and difficult uh, and that's because and but actually what's the case is that category theory makes a lot of things simpler. Um, but the people who need the simplicity most are the people who are doing very complicated stuff at the frontiers of mathematics, and they so, so they write books for experts. Uh, here's a bunch of books that uh, I think are quite readable. So there's uh, this book on applied category theory, which shows a lot of fun uh, uh, examples of how you can model all, all sorts of common sense or everyday situations or scientific uh, 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 phenomena using categories. Uh, there, here's a book that's written for high school students, uh, a book on understanding set theory from a categorical perspective, Topoi about logic from a categorical perspective, all very readable. Uh, here's just a few papers on this topic uh, by uh, well, Petar, who uh, I think gave a talk before, he's also completely uh, uh, now on board with this uh, this uh, categorical approach. Uh, and this is that tends to be this is quite a common thing. Some people are skeptical, but then once you really get it, uh, you see how powerful this uh, this approach is and how general it is. Um, this is just a small sampling. There's actually already quite a lot of papers on uh, the intersection of category theory and machine learning, and I would recommend this uh, GitHub page by uh, Gavranovich if you're uh, if you're curious. That's it. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and if there's time, I'm uh, happy to take questions. Otherwise, uh, put them in the Slack. Thank you awesome. very much.